Today, we're going to uh, answer a question from Penny. Did Judas receive Holy Communion at the Last Supper? Let's get started. What's up and welcome to the Ask Father Josh Show, the Catholic question and answer show on the Ascension Presents YouTube channel. So, did he receive Holy Communion at the Last Supper with the rest of the apostles? Well, this is debatable. The church does not have a clear teaching on this topic. Some scholars, some saints, some mystics in reading the scriptures would say, yes, Judas did receive communion. Some would even argue that that's why Paul wrote what he did in 1 Corinthians about people dying if they received communion unworthily, because some would argue that Judas received communion unworthily. And because he did that, that's why they would say he then shortly died thereafter, according to St. Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians. Other saints, scholars, and mystics would say, no, the, the gospels are not clear on this matter, and the church does not have a definitive teaching on this question as well. Uh, I want to address what God says about Holy Communion. So a number of years ago, I was invited to administer the last rites to a, a holy, holy, holy old man who was who was passing away. And so I was able to give him the sacraments, including Holy Communion, uh, before he passed away into eternity. And I spent time with his his family in their, their living room. And one of his daughters, she said to me, hey, Father, you know, I'm not Catholic anymore. I used to be Catholic. I'm not anymore. Uh, but I came to your, your mass recently. I really enjoyed it. I felt very welcome by the community, enjoyed the homily, thought the music was great. But I have a question you, you gave a shout out to your family who was with you at that mass, but a number of your family, I noticed, did not go up to receive Holy Communion. Why is that the case? And I said, yeah, you're very observant. Yeah, so my family, most of my family is actually not Catholic. Uh, I have about 40% of my family who are Roman Catholic. Uh, probably 50% of my family is Protestant, namely um, AME, African American Methodist Episcopalian, and about 10% of my family is non denominational evangelical Protestants. And so that's why the family you saw who came to Mass to worship with us did not receive communion, because those members don't believe what the church teaches about the Eucharist. They don't believe that Holy Communion is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And they don't want to present themselves before Holy Communion and lie by saying amen whenever I say the body of Christ, whenever I say the blood of Christ. They don't want to say amen because they don't want to lie when they don't believe it's Jesus. To say amen would be to saying, yeah, I believe this is the body of Christ. When they don't, they think it's just a symbol. They think he is just a symbol. That's why they don't receive. She said, well, Father, I don't want to argue with you, but they're right. The Eucharist isn't the body and blood of Christ. The Eucharist is just a symbol. And I said, well, have you talked to God about your belief that it's just a symbol? And she said, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a devout Christian and I talk to God every day and, and I know that the Eucharist is not the body and blood of Christ. The Eucharist is just a symbol. And I said, well, do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? She said, yeah. I said, do you believe that if we read the Bible, that we're listening to God speak to us today, the same way he spoke yesterday? Yeah. She said, yeah, of course. I love the Bible. I read the Bible every day. I believe when I read the Bible, God is speaking to me. So I said, well, instead of us talking about this, instead of us debating each other about whether or not the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ, why don't we ask Jesus right now, are you truly present in the Eucharist? Is the Eucharist a symbol or is the Eucharist your body, blood, soul, and divinity? Um, and let him respond to us through the Bible and just listen to him talk to us. She said, that's, that's a great idea, Father. I think we should definitely do that. So she got her Bible and she gave me her Bible and said, all right, let's, let's listen to Jesus Christ speak to us. And so that night I opened up the Bible to the Gospel of John chapter 6. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Uh, my all-time favorite is probably John 17, but this is one of my favorites. So Jesus said to them in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. All right, so then we're going we're gonna to jump down a little bit more to John chapter 6, verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not murmur among yourselves. And then he jumps down. We're going to go to John chapter 6, verses 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes his eternal life, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. 
This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then in John chapter 6, verse 52, says that the Jews began to quarrel among themselves. They, dis- they disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. See, in the Old Testament, uh, whenever Moses was used by God to free his people from Pharaoh, God fed his people with the manna, that miraculous bread that came down from heaven. But even though they ate that miraculous bread, which was a gift and a miracle, they still died. He's saying, I have something greater than that. If it's just a symbol, then how is it greater than the miraculous bread that came down from heaven? He's saying, you eat my flesh and drink my blood and you, and you will be saved. Right? This is like in the Old Testament, when the people ate the lamb of God, they were then saved. Jesus Christ, according to John the Baptist, is the Lamb of God. If you eat the Lamb of God, he's saying you will have eternal life. Then he goes on to say this in John chapter 6, verse 60. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying, but who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life to the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are the spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who those were that did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my father. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. Now, okay, so his disciples walked away. Now, if Jesus was just speaking about a symbol here, if, if he was saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood, it's just a symbol, when his disciples said, this is too much, we're going to walk away, if he was just speaking symbolically, he would have said, wait, y'all, you don't get it. Let me explain to you what I mean. Because all throughout the Bible, throughout the Gospels, when people did not understand Jesus, he would, he would say, okay, let me tell you what I'm trying to say here because y'all clearly don't get it. In this case, he didn't say, I'm just joking, or I'm just speaking with symbols here. So, John chapter 6, verse 68. Uh, Jesus said to the twelve, will you go away? And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, right? Lord, I don't maybe fully understand this teaching right now, but I trust you. And I believe in you. And I know over time I'm going to get it. So when I read this to the woman, she said, I've never read that before. I've never heard him say this to me before. So I said, so do you believe? She said, well, yeah, I can't disagree with Jesus. I I do believe that, that the Eucharist is Jesus Christ flesh and blood now because he said it. In the Gospel of Luke, also at the Last Supper, when he instituted the Eucharist in Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 19, he says, And he took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. He did not say this symbolizing my body. He said, This is my body. When God speaks, things happen, right? And so Jesus Christ, in the Word of God, makes it very clear to us that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what's also really cool is that St. Paul, who was not at the Last Supper, but became a disciple and an apostle later on, he was ministered to by the apostles. Uh, He says this in 1 Corinthians, and this is going to help us to understand what God says about the Eucharist as we begin to address the question whether or not did Judas actually receive Holy Communion at the Last Supper. St. Paul says this, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, the chalice after supper saying, this chalice is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this chalice, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Then St. Paul goes on to say, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. So the word of God teaches us, God teaches us that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ and that we should not receive the Eucharist 
in an unworthy manner, that if we do receive the Eucharist in an unworthy manner, without examining our hearts, uh, that we will place judgment on ourselves, and that many of us can be ill, sick, and die if we do receive the Lord Jesus Christ in Holy Communion in a state of serious sin. That's what the Word of God teaches us. Now, what does the church teach us about whether or not Judas received communion? Because what we do know is that Judas had already planned on betraying Jesus. By the time the Lord's Supper was about to happen, at the Last Supper, Judas had already, he had already strayed from the Lord. He was physically present, but his heart was already gone, right? The synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, seem to allude to Judas receiving communion, whereas the Gospel of John seems to allude that he did not receive Holy Communion. Let's go ahead and read really quick what the Gospel of, of Luke says about Holy Communion. So in Luke chapter 22, let's go back to the Gospels. There's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke, this is a fun lesson. I love the Bible. In Luke chapter 22, we read this again. But behold the hand, this is verse 21, of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. All right, so Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke that Judas was with them at the table. So the synoptics seem to allude that Judas potentially received Holy Communion with the rest of the apostles. But then you go on and you read the Gospel of John chapter 13, and it says this, When Jesus had thus spoken... He was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one, one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, that would be John, was lying close to the breast of Jesus. So Simon Peter beckoned to him and said, Tell us who it is of whom he speaks. So lying thus close to the breast of Jesus, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give the morsel when I have dipped it. So when he dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, then after the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money box, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should have given something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he, Judas, immediately went out and it was night. So John's gospel seems to tell us that Judas left. Now, well, it does tell us he left, but did he receive the morsel after receiving communion? Or did he receive communion and then go? Or did he go without receiving communion? We don't really know. It's not very clear. It seems to allude to him not receiving communion. But again, we don't know. So when we don't know, what do we do? Well, I always go to then the, the saints, the, the early church fathers, uh, the doctors of the church. I want to see what they said about this topic. But it's interesting. The saints also disagree with each other. Some saints say that Judas did receive communion and other saints say Judas did not receive communion. So who says that Judas did receive communion? One is one of the greatest preachers in the history of our church, St. John Chrysostom. He says this, Judas was there when the Lord spoke these words in the gospel of Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. This is the blood, O Judas, this is John Chrysostom, which you sold for 30 pieces of silver, this is the blood for which you, shortly before shamelessly bargained with the ungrateful Pharisees, oh, the great mercy of Christ, oh, the ingratitude of Judas, the master nourished and the slave betrayed. That one sold, have taken, having taken 30 pieces of silver, and Christ gave his own blood as a ransom for us, and he would have given it to the seller if, of course, he wanted it, because Judas was there before the betrayal. He took part in the holy meal and tasted the last supper. So John Chrysostom says he tasted the Last Supper. In addition to John Chrysostom saying that Judas received communion, so does St. Augustine. St. Augustine says it must be understood that our Lord had already distributed the sacrament of his body and blood to all his disciples, among whom was Judas also, as Luke narrates. So St. Augustine and St. John Chrysostom believe that Judas received Holy Communion at the Last Supper, but the saints aren't infallible. Some saints believe that he did not receive, including St. Hilary, who says Judas, very frankly, did not receive the body of Christ, and St. Ephraim, who says that, uh, that the Lord separated Judas. The same way he separates water, he separated Judas from his disciples when he gave him bread soaked in water. Because he was not worthy of that bread, the Eucharist, which together with wine was distributed to the twelve apostles. For it is not right that the one who betrayed him to death should receive him in the form of bread, him, Jesus, who saves us from death. So 
Again, some saints say he did, some saints say he didn't. If he did, you might say, why would God allow Judas, knowing Judas was already in sin? Like, again, Peter abandoned Jesus, and he also denied him. Uh, Thomas doubted Jesus. John even abandoned him uh, in the garden. But they didn't plan on doing this, whereas Judas was already, like, in sin when he received. So why would Jesus allow him to receive? What? Well, because Jesus allows all of us to receive unworthily, right? We shouldn't do it. It's very clear from the teachings of Scripture that we should not receive the Lord unworthily. But the thing about God is this, is God, he gives us free will. So I have the free will right now uh, to curse if I wanted to. Would it be good for me to do that? No. But God would not um, force me to be virtuous. God would not impose on me that I'm holy. God invites me to be holy. He proposes that I be virtuous. He invites me to not receive. He proposes that I should not receive communion unworthily. But love gives us free will. Love never imposes Love never forces. And so just as many people today receive the Lord Jesus Christ at the holy sacrifice of the mass unworthily, they've not gone to confession when they're in a state of grave sin, when they're in mortal sin, uh, just like he doesn't stop them from receiving. If Judas received, which we don't know, he, he wouldn't stop him. It was up to Judas to say, you know what? I shouldn't be doing this right now. I, I, I need to walk away. And it's up to us to do the same thing. Right, so God's not going to, to force us to be obedient to his, his commandments. He's going to invite us, but not force us. We have free will to say yes to Jesus. We have free will to say no to Jesus. We have free will to say, yes, God, I want to be a saint. And we have free will to say, no, God, I want to go to hell. God gives us free will to choose whether we're going to walk with him or walk away from him, whether we're going to be obedient to his teachings or be disobedient to his teachings. So what does this say to us about our community? Well, what this teaches us about our community is this. Just because we can do something does not mean we should do it, right? So we, we know that we can do something like receive communion whenever we want, but we should not. We should only receive communion whenever we are in a state of grace, according to the, church, the church's teachings and what's very clear to us in the teachings of St. Paul in the sacred scriptures. I know some people who don't go to mass if they're in a state of sin because they can't receive communion. We don't go to Mass just to receive communion. We go to Mass to worship God. The church teaches that we are only obligated to receive communion one time a year at Easter. And so after we receive our first Holy Communion, Easter is the only time we ought to receive communion. But we don't have to receive it every Sunday, particularly if we are in a state of grave sin and have not gone to confession. Now, should we receive it as often as possible because of the grace that are available to us in receiving communion? Yes, I think we should go to daily mass. But if you're not in a, in a state of grace, then go to mass to worship God and don't receive communion until we've been to confession. The USCCB, it teaches us this. As Catholics, we fully participate in the celebration of the Eucharist when we receive Holy Communion. We are encouraged to receive Holy Communion devoutly and frequently. In order to be properly disposed to receive communion, participants should not be conscious of grave sin and normally should have fasted for one hour. A person who is conscious of grave sin is not to receive the body and blood of the Lord without prior sacramental confession, except for a grave reason where there is no opportunity for confession. In this case, the person is to be mindful of the obligation to make an act of perfect contrition, including the intention of confessing as soon as possible. Canon 916. A frequent reception of the sacrament of penance is encouraged for all. So look, come to Mass, worship God, but don't receive communion if you're not in a state of grace. Go to confession. Wait till you go to confession and then receive communion after you receive God's mercy and forgiveness through the sacrament of reconciliation. Now to circle all the way back to Judas and whether or not he receives or not, what is clear is that the Eucharist is God and that we ought not to receive the Eucharist if we um, are in a state of grave sin. And so did he receive or not? We don't know. But what we do know is what scriptures we've talked about today, the Synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel and Paul's writing his letter. What we do know is what the saints said. Some said yes, some said no. So what I want to encourage you to do is do Lexio Divina. Pray with the writings of the saints. Pray with the Gospels. Pray with John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then afterwards, share in the comment section below what you think. Did he receive or did he not? It's all speculative theology, right? Because the church does not have a clear teaching on this particular topic. Uh, so uh, the only thing that's clear, again, is that the Eucharist is God and that we ought to not receive the Eucharist if we have not properly discerned if we are in a state of grace. Uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into our glory story. Glory story comes in from Colin. Colin writes this, for the past few years, I've been having car trouble and now as a college student, having no car has its challenges. However, I have found some good of having no car. I pray the rosary every Sunday when I walk to Mass, even in 
below freezing temperatures, that's love, right? When you, when you love somebody, you would do anything for them. I pray the rosary when I'm walking to church to help out with religious education on Wednesday nights. And I picked up the habit of praying the rosary multiple times every day. And I carry the rosary in my hand when I go about my day. Doing these things has truly decreased my sinning. And I'm grateful for the wonderful weapon of the rosary. That's right. The rosary is a weapon. And every time Blessed Mother appears in Fatima and Lourdes in Cabello, Africa, what does she say? She says, pray the rosary. So Colin, I'm grateful for you that you are responding to Our Lady's invitations to meditate on the life of her son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, by praying the rosary every day. And that you're also seeing the fruits of that and the sin of your life decreasing in the season of your life discipleship. With that, let's go ahead and close with a prayer. We're going to pray the Anima Christi. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from you. From the wicked foe, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me. And bid me come to you, that with your saints I may praise you forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That wraps up today's show. If you want to uh, continue to walk with me, I want to encourage you to check out my podcast on iTunes and Spotify and Google Play. Ask Father Josh. It airs every single Thursday. And also you can read our books, Broken and Blessed, Pocket Guide to Adoration, and Pocket Guide to... The Sacrament of Reconciliation, as well as my new book that's coming out at the end of April on Earth as it is in Heaven, Restoring God's Vision for Race and Discipleship. In this book, I accompany you in fulfilling the, the, the Great Commission, helping you to go out and make disciples of people of every race and of every ethnicity, of every gender, of every age, of every socioeconomic background, of all the people who live within the geographical boundaries of your community, so that your churches on earth can begin to look a lot more like John's vision of the church in heaven that he saw in the book of Revelation when he saw people of every race, nation, tribe, and tongue together worshiping God. So that's our goal, and I want to help you do that. So if you want to learn more about that book and how you can fulfill the Great Commission, then go to www.assistionpress.com slash on earth so you can find out when you can pre-order the book at the end of this month. All right, God bless.